welcome to the University of Denver's Oral History. Our series begins in the mid-1980s, when DU was on the brink of bankruptcy, and continues to 2014, with the university a regional academic leader poised for national prominence. The interviews in this series present a panorama of progress against steep odds. They're stories told by men and women who were personally involved in saving the university and undertaking an extraordinary process of renewal. We've divided our story into three parts, the first being DU's severe financial crisis of the 1980s, then the dramatic financial turnaround in the early 1990s, followed by a decade of remarkable growth and renewal. Our guest is Professor Barry Hughes, who's been at the University of Denver throughout this period and who has made major contributions to DU in several capacities. Barry, welcome to DU's Oral History. Thanks very much, Jim. Glad to be here. Honored to be here. <laughs> so maybe, well, let's begin at the beginning. Um, how did you come to join the University of Denver in the first place? I came in 1980. I had um, a mathematics and international studies kind of background. I was at Case Western Reserve University in the 1970s for a decade. And the School of International Studies, the Graduate School of International Studies, as it was called at that time, was a good fit for me because it's an interdisciplinary program and it deals with the kinds of things that I was already getting involved in, in terms of looking at global change. And then when, what year did you come to DU? I came in 1980. 1980. So uh, when you came to the university, uh, it was a period of uh, gathering clouds. <laughs> um, uh, and early in your career at DU, um, the financial crisis um, really began to unfold. As, as a young professor, um, were you aware of it? And if so, what was your reaction? Actually, I, I, I'm naive on lots of fronts, Jim. <laughs> and uh, even though I had been told by some of my colleagues that DU was a somewhat risky place at, when I was at Case Western because of the low level of the endowment, uh, I, um, I came, I, I was happy here, and uh, when the clouds uh, became obvious to me, it was a bit of a surprise and a shock, obviously. It, 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 uh, it, it threw into some question whether I should stay. <laughs> Did you think about going somewhere else? Well, I was actually uh, uh, recruited to some considerable degree by the University of Maryland at College Park okay. and about, about 1985, uh, just at the beginning of this. And, and I remember at that time asking myself uh, about this hard decision. It was a good program out there. And I, I made a contact with Roger Campbell, uh, admissions, undergraduate admissions uh, officer at that time, right. and went over to his office at the bottom of Mary Reed at that time in an incredibly smoke-filled room uh, with, with Roger and, and asked him uh, what he thought our prospects were we talked for some considerable time about uh, demographic change in the university, and and he convinced me that there was a a reasonably good chance. He didn't sugarcoat it, but a reasonably good chance that we were going to make it through this quite comfortably uh, after some time. Uh, hard decision, but I decided to stay. Well, that was to DU's benefit. Um, in spite of DU's financial issues at the time, um, you were moving forward with academic programs. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, actually, um, the school, Graduate School of International Studies at that time was almost entirely a PhD program with a few terminal masters along the line, but it was really oriented towards a small number of students. And it also became fairly obvious to me at that time that the economic viability of such a program was, was somewhat questionable in this, in this environment. Uh, we needed to expand the master's program. Uh, which many of my colleagues understood, and we also needed, in my mind, an undergraduate program in international studies. So at that time, I actually, uh, with the support of the, the dean, obviously, uh, sought out funding from the Department of Education to begin an undergraduate international studies program in the university. When would that have been, Barry? That was, I mean, it's around 84, 85, okay. uh, just at the beginning, again, of, 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 of our understanding of the, of the uh, situation more generally around the university. But I already was seeing some of the issues inside GSIS. 
So I, I was able to get the grant. I worked for a year or two actually in formulating the program, had the, the dean's approval, and uh, only at that time did it uh, come to my attention that it required university approval also. <laughs> It was a bit of a surprise to me because I had no idea what the administrative processes were, but I was brought in front of the undergraduate uh, council of the university and given quite a grilling on this program. Uh, the expectation of, of uh, academic programs at that time was very disciplinary, and mm -hmm. I remember being asked more than once, uh, what kind of a discipline international studies really was. <laughs> and I've always been focused, as you well know, on interdisciplinary programs, right. on integration of academic uh, areas. So uh, with some difficulties, but not probably dramatic ones, it was <clears throat> approved. It, within a fairly short time, uh, a few years, became actually the second largest major in the, in the undergraduate uh, programs of the university. It's still very large. I don't know where, exactly where it ranks. One of my first students was Marjorie Smith, who is now uh, a vice chancellor, is that mm -hmm. her official title, for international, so, yes. inter international programs? <clears throat> a wonderful woman. And uh, we've had all kinds of good graduates uh, from that program. So uh, that new program was, was really instrumental at the time in helping DU build its its overall enrollment. Yeah, actually, I, th I think we contributed. I don't think there's any question. Yeah, and and in addition to starting this program, which which grew pretty rapidly, um, you took on some university-wide administrative responsibilities. How did that, how did that happen? Well, in 1990, I was I received a phone call from Bill Saranka, provost, mm -hmm. who invited me to come in and talk about the position of uh, vice provost for graduate studies. And I have to admit again to my naivete because I'm not even quite sure why he called me. I assume it had something to do with that undergraduate program, but then uh, to be invited uh, to look at the uh, the graduate right. uh, uh, vice provost position, I, I don't. Quite, I still to this day don't know exactly how I came to his attention. But uh, yes, it was 1990. Uh, I was invited to to take that position, and again after some considerable reflection, decided to do it. Well, how did you how did you enjoy the position? Uh, the first two years, uh, given the fact that I didn't really know what the position was really about, were, were very especially challenging because one of the first things that happened to me was when Jackie Kamer, who was then the executive uh, 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 support person for mm -hmm. that program, uh, and I sat down. She explained to me that one of my jobs was uh, allocating graduate assistantships across the university. Uh, so building spreadsheets, figuring out uh, where the enrollments were, where the money was going, uh, uh, and then finding out that after I tried to move two from one place to another place, I got all kinds of pushback from the deans involved. Uh, it, it, it didn't make any sense to me. Uh, and it wasn't, it wasn't exactly a happy time in my <laughs> life. So uh, at that point, given what was going on in the university with the decentralization of budgets, mm -hmm. it made all the sense in the world to, to turn those graduate assistants uh, into budgetary line items within the um, respective units and to let them decide exactly uh, how many of those positions and how, how to fund them. So that's, that was a major uh, relieving a burden on, on my shoulders. And then that allowed you to focus on other things and in other areas. And this is, I think, really quite important because we're now moving into the period that we've called a tide of renewal yeah. in the university. Yeah, exactly. Lots of things started happening, and you were a major part of that. Can you talk about some of those? Well, it was obvious to me that, first of all, uh, graduate programs could be built up around the university with higher enrollments. And, and uh, 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 graduate programs often are counter-cyclical economically mm -hmm. with respect to uh, um, uh, economic cycles in the broader economy and even with respect to undergraduate programs. So we needed more graduate enrollments, and I thought one of the best ways of achieving that besides supporting existing programs was to build new ones. Uh, uh, and there was a lot of prospect, I thought, for, again, interdisciplinary programs, cutting across units. Uh, we instituted a flexible dual degree program uh, to let people take more than one uh, master's program simultaneously. We introduced uh, uh, a, a wide variety of new graduate programs from uh, 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 logistics, uh, to uh, 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 to 
uh, uh, digital media studies to a master's degree in professional psychology. I mean, there were a large number that we, we brought through again this time, the Graduate Council uh, and, and uh, instituted and built enrollment for around the university. I, I, don't, I can't even count them because there were a large number in, in, in Daniels yes. in the business school. There were a significant number in, in uh, Corbell School, uh, then GSIS. Uh, they, they were being built around the university. How did you interact with the deans and uh, how did you encourage, and I, th I know for a fact you did, people to think uh, in uh, innovative, pro innovative programs? Well, the environment was right because the environment had begun to empower uh, uh, local administrative units, uh, academic units, mm -hmm. uh, decentralization of, of budgets, transparency with respect to budgets, uh, uh, gain share uh, opportunities, uh, the, the potential that you and Dan and so many others uh, at the university had put in place to support uh, local academic units also empowered them and incentivized them to do this. So sitting down with them, giving them some examples of programs that were coming online and in place uh, uh, made it possible to, 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 uh, to really get their involvement and their support in doing this. I mean, it wasn't something that came just from the top, obviously. They, yes. had, they had to want these programs. They had to think through what would work uh, in, in the market and for their existing students and, and, and put the, the proposals on the table. It was a very exciting time. As it we was both, We both yeah. recall. Yeah. Well, um, in spite of your success, and it was considerable um, in a senior administrative role, um, you chose to move back to the academic realm. Um, when would that have been, and, and uh, what led you back to the, to the academic side? Well, I had continued, uh, even as a university administrator, to work on uh, a computer software system called International Futures, uh, which looks at long-term global change and helps people think about long-term global change. I continued that. I'd, I'd written a couple of, of, uh, of books about it, uh, even in the 1990s, uh, uh, in the evenings and weekends. Even early could, on, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and uh, uh, between 1998 and 2003, roughly, a number of opportunities started coming my way. First opportunity was actually an invitation to uh, go to Brussels uh, and uh, to meet with people at the European Union there. Uh, the, the European Union has a series of, of what they call framework programs. They sponsor academic, innovative academic activities across uh, uh, institutions within Europe. And uh, I was brought into a program that had 12 European institutions and us. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was exciting because we were working with what was then called the new economy uh, the, the information and communications technology uh, in, uh, uh, supported economic transformations that we were seeing uh, oh. around the world and, and to think about how those were affecting Europe and, and, and the world more generally. So it was a good program and it lasted about three years, took me to various institutions around Europe. And then did that lead to other opportunities? Things, these things tend to build on, Exa on exactly, each other. Exactly. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, uh, about the same time, actually, I was invited to Washington uh, and uh, uh, brought into a group on the analytical side, I want to emphasize, of the CIA, <laughs> uh, and, and asked, again, about how that tool, the International Future System, could support some of their uh -huh. looking at, at strategic environmental change uh, uh, for the United States. And that led to a, 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 a connection which at, in the year 2000 or 2001, when I was coming back from the European Union, mm -hmm. I was asked to stop in Washington and meet with somebody who, named Ambassador Robert Hutchings, who was the head at that time of, of the National Intelligence Council. National Intelligence Council is a peak intelligence organization mm -hmm. reporting to the Director of Intelligence. And every four years, they do a report to the president, either returning or, or, or new president, uh, that, that's been called Global Trends. And looking at the, the, in, the, the international security environment, again, for the US under different scenarios. And they asked me at that time to participate in the one that they were 
that they oh. had started. And I actually supported, participated in with this system, this International Futures uh, Forecasting System, the next three of those. So that was beginning also to, to come on, on online. So by 2000, and that was shortly after my, my stopping in Washington uh, uh -huh. uh, at the National Intelligence Council, I realized that too many things were pressing on me and I really needed to ask to be uh, uh, relieved from the, from the administrative post. Okay. And then um, I know you were traveling around um, using the, the, what was then the new International Futures tool. Um, today, we, you had a center. Um, I think the story is an interesting one about how the, those connections led to the creation of the center that you now had. Well, some of those things that I was doing, the, the, the books that were out, the European project, the Washington, actually, I think especially the Washington project, brought me to the attention of an organization called RAND, uh, uh, which is a, a think tank uh, mm -hmm. uh, with a major headquarters out in Santa Monica. And I was invited by a group there to come out in 2003 uh, to uh, make a presentation of what we were doing in front of, uh, of a group called the Pardee Center out there. Frederick Pardee was the founder of that. And I, was, I had enough chutzpah, I guess, uh, to, to suggest that maybe uh, Pardee would enjoy uh, coming into the, the meeting where we were talking about things. And he and I hit it off very well. Uh, it turns out that after uh, a couple of years, our relationship uh, continued to develop and he began to support some of our activities here at the University of Denver. And I think it was about 2006 or eight, I, I lose track of the years sure. a little bit, but in that period, uh, we began to talk about and then institute the Frederick S. Pardee Center for International Futures here at the university. Well, the Pardee Center is um, something for which DU is today known globally. Um, for our viewers who, who may not um, be familiar with it though, in terms of details, could you talk about how the center, what you do, how it's evolved, and um, uh, the areas that you focus on and, and the folks that you do work for? Okay. The, um, the, the party center is built heavily around this international future system, which is a, an integrated set of models crossing multiple issue areas, economics, demographics, energy, agriculture, uh, uh, governance, um, some environmental impacts, obviously, including climate change. And that integrated system can be used by all kinds of, of organizations and governments. And it has been of interest to a variety of international organizations, including the World Bank, the United Nations, um, uh, obviously, again, the European Union, but a new project we've just begun uh, with the African Union, actually, in support of, of, of some of their activities. And it's also been of interest to national governments, including, again, uh, uh, within the U.S. government, uh, but also governments like Peru, South Africa, Egypt, uh, Uzbekistan. Uh, we're working at, at fairly actively right now with something called the United Nations Development Program, which, uh, uh, as a branch of the U.N., has a particular interest in something called the Sustainable Development Goals. That's a set of, of global goals that have, have been widely accepted by, by countries around the world as things that we should try to achieve as early as 2030 if possible, but certainly thereafter, reduction of poverty, uh, elimination of hunger, provision of water and sanitation, uh, better governance, uh, uh, controlling climate change. And the UNDP has connected us with a number of national governments also. I think it's interesting that your your history, your professional history, and the center really blends um, academic research, but in, in uh, the service of dealing with world problems. Um, it's, it's not only a great contribution, but I imagine it, it has to be satisfying for you to work on that. It is, because uh, going all the way back to your earlier question about coming to the University of Denver, mm -hmm. uh, I realized uh, fairly early on after my PhD that, that working in a kind of traditional disciplinary environment focused on theory and, and uh, 
uh, relatively narrowly constrained uh, uh, focus of attention just was not my thing. Uh -huh. uh, and I needed to, to, to broaden the scope, needed to be more interdisciplinary and to, to tie it to the applied world, to, 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 to try to, 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 to do something of service. We, you, you mentioned earlier um, areas that you look at in attempting to assess um, the impact of policy and future conditions. Um, could you talk a little bit about what are, what are some of those major areas and uh, what their importance is to various countries? Yeah, I, I often think about them in terms of, of three, what I sometimes call domains of, of issues. Mm -hmm. And these correspond again back to the sustainable development goals to a large degree. The first one is human development. And that involves education and health and a basic level of, of, of income, escaping poverty for people. If you do that, you empower people uh, to, mm -hmm. to move on and, and accomplish things on their own. And, and, and we've got a lot of work to do around the world, billion people who are still in poverty and, 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 and hunger around the world. Uh, second domain is governance and sociopolitical elements. And again, it, it, to some degree, an, an empowerment issue because you need, you need uh, uh, governance, which is the relationship between people and, and, and government, mm -hmm. to be not corrupt, to be transparent, and to be effective. And so though that is another set of, of, of issue areas in this second domain of, of, of really government improvement or governance improvement. And the third one is sustainability. Uh, you, uh, we, we need to be thinking about the next generations in terms of uh, avoiding uh, a runaway climate change, uh, dealing with water problems, uh, localized air, air and other pollution. Uh, so, so the sustainability side is a third domain. And these three together are, are highly interactive. Uh, uh, the study of the, the, the uh, sustainable development goals and our work with uh, international organizations and national governments is really focused to a large degree, not just on each one individually, but on their interactions. As you think about um, the world, recognizing that different countries are at various stages in, in these uh, domains that you describe. What is, what is sort of your personal take on, on how, how the world is going in, in, <laughs> in, in, in the terms that you all think about this? Some things are going very well. Uh, I mean, we really are making a lot of progress on, on, on uh, universal, not just primary education, which is to a significant degree achieved around the world, uh, but now moving into universal secondary education. Uh, uh, healthcare has improved quite dramatically. Life expectancy has been going up just about everywhere mm -hmm. after some downturn in Africa with the HIV AIDS epidemic for a few years. But it, there are a lot of advances in human development. The, adva the problems are, as we well know, uh, heavily on the sustainability side. And, and those are, are areas where I, I find myself challenged to be as optimistic as I would like to be, uh, and, I, and I, I am on the human development side. So it's that tension between those two that, 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 that generates an awful lot of the analysis that we, we actually try to do and help countries with. Well, it's been remarkable how, um, how your center has grown um, under under your leadership, and and now you've uh, passed the baton to others, and mm -hmm. are are playing uh, a greater role in in the strategic direction. <clears throat> um, as throughout your career at DU, um, both as an administrator, as an academician, and really as a creator of one of the university's major programs, what um, as you face opportunities and challenges. Um, what what values have guided you? What what principles um, do you sort of rely on as you have to make decisions? Um, is there is there sort of a, a ground, uh, an, an ethical and intellectual grounding that you s sort of have relied on? I was really glad, Jim, that you you told me you were going to ask me this question <laughs> because it gave me a, a little chance over the last couple of weeks to be thinking about it. And the more I've thought about it, I've gone through several iterations of, of answer to that. And the word empowerment is the one that has mm -hmm. kind of come to the top of my, my mind because education is about empowerment. 
Uh, we try to offer our students support without going overboard and, and into, into coddling, and we try to offer them challenge. And that's balance between support and challenge is, in my mind, an awful lot of what empowerment is. And it t t goes over to, to what this university has, has gone through, in my mind, because the, the combination of those things, the empowerment of people around the university and of the academic units, I think was fundamental to the thinking, again, of Dan and you and others in shaping the, the, the environment uh, of, of, the, of the game chair, of the, of the uh, 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 responsibility that was given to people for their own budget, but also the opportunity to develop new programs and, and, and to, to make the changes. It's that combination of support and incentivization that, and challenge mm -hmm. that, that really, I think, the empowerment was critical to the turnaround of this institution. And I think it's been important in my, my own academic work and in the center work. I try, I, I define myself now as senior scientist and mentor. Uh -huh. And mentoring is about empowering. It's about providing support yes. and, also, and also challenge. Uh, I think that that combination is, is critical. Now, that leads to lots of other values. I mean, transparency was, in my mind, a really important one in this transformation of the institution and in what we do academically. You have to let people know what their situation is. You have to give them some information about their, their expenditures, their revenues, their balance uh, institutionally. In terms of what we do in the Pardee Center, uh, it's been critically important to me that we are transparent with respect to the tool. We make it publicly available, public source. Uh, we're trying to empower people to understand the again what's what's going right and what's not going right, and 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 to try to make some decisions. Uh, so the the transparency is, is is a significant part of that, and and with that obviously goes the integrity you mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. because uh, you have to trust people, you have to give them support. Uh, uh, but then you have to hold them responsible. All of those things together are part of the, of the integrity side of that empowerment. So I, I think though that's that cluster of values, uh, which your question led me to think about, uh, empowerment is kind of at the top of the list. Well, Professor Barry Hughes, thank you so much for joining us. Um, your contributions to the university have been very significant and continue to be. Um, I hope you'll join us as we continue to look at the remarkable renaissance of the University of Denver. I'm Jim Grismer. Thank you for watching.